Hello everybody, I'm Bruce Kyle. I'm an architect evangelist. I work with software companies in Oregon, Washington, Utah, Colorado, in the United States, and wherever you are. Today we're going to talk about how to parallelize or how to get your application to work on multiple cores. We're going to break this into three parts. The first part is why should you go about doing it? And this is pretty much slideware. I'm just going to walk you through the rationale and show you a little bit about how the cores are divided and, and how uh, the operating system thinks about parallel processing. In part two, we're going to show you why threads uh, are different from task or the system.threading.task libraries that are now part of the .NET 4 framework and how you can use them in your application and what the difference in thought processes you might need to have when you're thinking about your application. In part three, we're going to talk about the different tasks of how you can use those from the .NET framework version four and how you use them in your code. And I'll show you the three different methods and I'll show you a comparison by how they work with uh, how you would normally do that today and I'll show you how uh, the difference of how much faster your application will work. So the issue is is that in the old days uh, the clock speeds would basically increase and the faster and faster processors would mean that your application would run faster and faster and that you could do more things. But what's happened is is that the number while the number of transistors increase the clock speed uh, other processors can't go any faster and there's some reasons for this which I'll talk about in a minute but the whole issue is is that uh, the clock speed increases or the the Moore's law has been mistakenly uh, assumed that it's going to continue on and on and that it would be work that way on a single processor but it doesn't what it means is that the uh, increase in clock speed means more power and more power means more heat output and the hotter the computer gets the more it needs cooling and what that means is is that it cannot keep continue to scale up what we have to do is break down the processors and to do multiple things at the same time instead of just making it go faster and faster and hotter and hotter in fact at Microsoft we have this thing called the intense computing and this is an actual experiment that was going on at Microsoft where they would uh, put computers or racks of computers inside of tents in order to air cool them. And of course uh, leaves and uh, bugs crawl in. But while this is sort of humorous, uh, we have announced in a very recent uh, uh, announcement that the future of, of, of data centers is around building smaller data centers in locations where you can air cool the place. That said, uh, most of the data centers, uh, Microsoft data centers, are using bigger or multiple core processors and we're doing it more and more efficiently in order to give you more processing power. So this has meant that there's a multi-core shift. <clears throat> but to do this you must manage your, the platform itself, the operating system needs to manage the resources effectively. What that means is that at Windows 7 and Windows Server 2008 R2 are the first real operating systems to take advantage of this multiple cores. It also means that your programs must be written differently. You must do more than just manage the threads. Threads are really awesome for dealing with two things, having a single processor do with two things at once. But what we have now is this ability, this need for to do two things at once on multiple processors. And what that means is your application needs to be able to scale up or down based on usage and based on the needs of the computer uh, on your application itself. In fact, in Windows 2008 R2, it is one of the four basic things, four big tenets of the things that we added to Windows Server to make it more, uh, more useful to you. One of those is... Uh, is this ability to have to support more than up to 256 processors. So this is an actual application. This happens to be SQL Server 2008 R2 
and you see that it's pegged. It's going all out on 256 processors. And if you look closely, you'll see that each one of those squares represents a processor on the computer, and it actually takes a monitor probably bigger than the one that you're looking at right now in order to display all those uh, processors inside a task manager. So Windows organizes the many cores via this idea of a group. A group consists of one or, no, no, one or more nodes, and a node has a, one or more sockets, a socket has one or more cores, and a core can one, have one or more logical processors. Now, what's interesting is that you need to know this only if you're a C++ programmer and are going to program directly to the hardware. If you're a .NET programmer, you need to know only that the CLR uses processor group zero and that it just handles this behind just handles it for you uh, when you when you use the system dot threading dot task class classes it also means that dot net only supports the first 64 processors you don't get all 256 processors at once but when you you stop and think about it that's probably enough for the foreseeable future for commodity uh, based hardware. So here's an example of how you could have 128 logical processors based into two groups with four nodes, eight sockets, and 32 cores, and four logical processors per core. This is just one way that it could be organized. To find out how your particular program or how your particular processor is organized, you can use this program called Core Info from SysInternal. And Core Info uses this, uh, will produce this report like is given on my machine right here that shows uh, what the Newman node structure is. In this case it shows uh, two logical processors, pro physical processor 0 and 1. It shows one socket, it shows one Newman node, n number 0, and then it has a logical processor to cache map which it, it also shows you. And what's interesting about that is that you can use uh, you can use internal code to actually look at that. So I'm going to do a de quick demo here to show you how to check your computer. So in this demonstration, I'm going to call a core info, and I'm just going to call it from a batch file. So here it is. Uh, my batch file consists of core info dot exe and the pause command so we can actually take a look at it. And here you see that I have a physical processor 0 and 1, uh, the sockets, Newman nodes, and the various processor caches. So core info from sysinternals actually calls get logical processor information function that's part of the Windows API. And you can look it up just like I did here. If you're a C++ programmer and you want to program directly against the NUMA nodes, what you do is you look through this exact same class hierarchy here uh, on, th on par process and thread functions, and you can see the list, anything that's labeled NUMA, it's what you need to access the processors in whatever way that you want to see fit. And what you can do then is you, at a very fine grain level, you can uh, determine exactly where you want the processing to take place inside your application. So, so far we've talked a little bit about why you do it. In our next talk I'll describe the, the difference between threads and tasks and then in part three we'll talk about how system.threading.task, how you can actually call those from your .NET 4 program. So here are some resources that you might want to have. I'll go ahead and post this on the uh, posting on Channel 9 where I post this uh, video. And uh, we'll uh, see you next time.